if you need a, a sermonic title to uh, the message this morning for those who are meticulously taking notes, at the top of your page you could put the road to destiny. The road to destiny. Just as a reminder to those who are taking notes. In the next few days, beloved, we all know that we're going to enter the dawn of a new year. Yes, sir. Many of you have no doubt New Year's resolutions. Some of you who are traditional and sort of old school will be cooking your collard greens and your black eyed peas and your ham hocks, believing that as we enter into a new year, God is going to shower you with blessings. And there are some things that you expect God to change and bless you during the time of a new year. But I want you to know on this morning that if you do not do something yourself, the only thing that's going to change as we enter into a new year is time. And we ought to study time because time is important. Time is constant. It is continuous. It is consistent. It is ceaseless. It has cerebral movement. You want to study time. Time is so consistent. It does not stop for anyone. It did not stop for Adam and Eve. It does not stop for the summer, the winter, the spring, nor the fall. Time keeps on going. Time moves regardless of whether you move or keep still. You can be 15 years old and look up and the next thing you know you're 40. And then you start asking questions like, where did time go? Because you understand time is something that continuously keeps moving. Study time, it's consistent. If you want it to be like anything outside of Jesus, be like time. It's always moving, it's constant, it never stops. As a matter of fact, time, beloved, is priceless. Because if you are rich and have all the money that you could spend in the world, you cannot buy time. And what makes time so interesting, beloved, is that you can't buy it, but you can spend it. There is a writer by the name of Leo Tolstoy who penned a piece called War and Peace. And here's what he said, and I quote, the two most uh, powerful warriors are patience and time. Benjamin Franklin said, lost time is never found again. There was a Greek philosopher by the name of Theophrastus, and he said, time is the most valuable thing a man can spend. And when you use time, it gives you an opportunity to do something, which culminates in a moment, and moments create memories, and the usefulness of your moments determine whether or not your moments will become history. Don't waste your time. I want you to tell your neighbor that. Go ahead. Don't waste your time. Look at the other neighbor and tell them the same thing. Go ahead. Use your time wisely. Because there was a man who was in this passage named Saul. And Saul was wasting his time. Saul was traveling down the right road, but he had the wrong purpose. You didn't hear that. He was traveling down the right road, but he had the wrong purpose. Do you not know that you can be traveling down the right road, but end up having the wrong purpose? 
God help me in this place. What, what, when God, when God looks at your life and he recognizes you are on the wrong road with the, the right road rather with the wrong purpose and you don't realize it, sometimes God had to give you what I call an experience. Everybody shout experience. So when you are traveling down the right road, then you don't understand that you actually have the wrong purpose in your life. Right road, but wrong purpose. Right road, but got the wrong mindset. Right road, but not doing the right thing. Right road, but not using all your gifts for God. Right road, but not doing the thing that God has put you on earth to do. Sometimes God has to help you realize that you're not having the right purpose, and then God has to give you an experience. So the question is, what happens when you travel down the right road but don't realize you got the wrong purpose? God must give you an experience. Saul was a tent maker from Tarsus. He was thirsty for righteousness. He had a zeal for God, a zeal for the law, a zeal for morality, but he had a passion to persecute Christians because Christians believe in Jesus and Saul was one of the Jews who focused on Judaism which, which discredited Jesus as being the son of God so he wanted to bind everybody up who had a different religious belief than the religion of Judaism, the religion of the Jews and, and, and who believed in Christianity and he wanted to bind those people because he was so zealous for what he believed in he didn't want anybody else not to believe in the law of Moses and Judaism so if you were a Christian during the time of Saul and he found out that you believe in Jesus Christ he would try to arrest you and lock you up and bind you and put you in jail because he thought that he was doing the right thing and he thought he was on the right road he just had the wrong purpose <laughs> and so Saul was traveling down the right road with the wrong purpose. Let me say it one more time. He was traveling down the right road. He just had the wrong purpose. Saul deliberately intended to persecute those of the way, which were followers of Christianity and Jesus Christ. We find that in Acts chapter 9 and verses 1 and 2. He was persecuting them. The idea of persecution means to follow a person around with the intent to pose harm, hurt, or danger to them. He wanted to bind them up. He was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. He did not like those who followed the religion of Jesus Christ, who at that time were called the way, and Saul would do any and everything he could do to arrest you. He would go to your house. You will be peeking through your blinds, trying to see if that was Saul out there, because if Saul is out there, you may go to jail. Both men and women, and he was so zealous that he said, I'm going to go to Damascus, and he got a letter from the high priest saying, if I, uh, I want you to write a letter to those from, at the synagogue in Damascus, because if I find anybody following Christ, I want to have the authority to bind them up and bring them back to Jerusalem and put them in jail. Uh -huh. Saul was some kind of fellow, but, but he had zeal, but his zeal was in the wrong purpose. But the thing I love about God, beloved, is even though you may have the wrong purpose now, God looks at your zeal. Because what God wants to do is change your purpose. Let's say it together. Change your purpose. Let's personalize it. Change my purpose. I, I remember back in the day, uh, I used to have a preacher friend of mine who used to be a drug dealer. Uh, Y'all right? I said drug dealer. I ain't, I ain't hitting nothing here. Yeah, y'all know some of these pharmacists are really drug dealers, praise God. Yeah, Lord. And uh, he was, used to be a drug dealer, but now he ended up becoming a preacher. And I said, tell me how your process went. He said, I really didn't change anything. He said, the only thing I did, uh, I still got the gift of gab. I still can hustle. I still can go to people and get them to do things and persuade them. He said, all I did was change my product. Y'all ain't even in here this morning. He said, all I did was change my product. I used to sell dope. Oh, do I have a witness in this place on this morning? I still got zeal. I still can sell. I still can persuade. All I did was change my product. So instead of a dope dealer, he became a hope dealer. Are y'all in this place on this morning? Same person, same gifts. All he did was change. 
his product. He changed his purpose. He, his purpose used to be to put poison into people's body. Now his job now is to put the gospel into somebody's mind, even somebody. So God can still use you despite your current path right now. Amen, somebody. And that's what I want to tell you on this morning, that despite what you've done, uh, despite what you've been through, the Lord still wants to use you while you're on the time side of life. I said he still wants to use you, beloved. Anybody happy about that? Because the devil wants to convince you that you're damaged goods. God has no purpose for you. That's not true. The Lord still wants to use you. As a matter of fact, your life, you beloved, brothers and sisters, you, your life is one big pot of gumbo. <laughs> Good experiences, bad experiences. You got some highs and you got some lows. You know what it's like to be on the mountaintop, but you've spent some time in the valley. Do I have one or two people in here that can shout amen on that? You've been in the valley. And it wasn't for a day or two, it was for years, even somebody. So you know what it's like. And God, I believe God, gives you unique experiences that only people like you can have so that you can relate to different people. Because even though you may have a little money in your pocket now and may have a, you know, a 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 square foot home now, you know what it's like to live in a matchbox. <laughs> Ain't got nobody that used to be poor back in the day. You know what it's like to live in a little small room with eight kids. Amen, somebody. You know what it's like to have to go outside to use the bathroom. Do I have anybody in this place on this morning? You know what it's like to be embarrassed for people to come to your house. So you can relate to people so your life. See, you ought, you ought to be happy to be you. <laughs> Anybody in here happy? I, Brett Jones, I would change that in my life for the world. I'm happy that I'm me. I'm happy that I'm this person because I know that my life uh, went the way it went for a reason. Your life is one big part of gumbo and God is trying to stir that thing up so that you can help somebody with all of your life experiences. Is anybody in this place on this morning? And he wants to take those experiences and use you to his glory. God can take a person who loves to smoke weed and get high through drugs and then bless them to become a worshiper who likes to get high off the spirit. <laughs> he can turn a liar into a leader, a prostitute into a praiser, a pimp into a preacher, an atheist into a believer. If you've never seen a miracle before in your life, don't worry about it. Just look up at me and pray. <laughs> Somebody, name of Jesus. Y'all just look at me. You look at me. I wish I had somebody in here to know I'm a miracle, baby. They never thought I was naked. They never thought I'd get out. I wish I had somebody in this place. They never thought I would be successful. They never thought I could do it. But look at me now. Back then, they didn't want me. But now I'm hot. Still use you. So the gospel writer Luke literally looks at the landscape of life through the lenses of the apostles in this historical narrative in the book of Acts. As I guide your attention to verse number three, you'll find these words somewhere in that passage. It says, in the New American Center, he says, as he was traveling. The King James Version says, and as he journeyed, God gave Saul an experience. Notice the experience, beloved. He was on the road to Damascus to bind Christians. But as he was on that road, the Bible says that there was a light from heaven that flashed around him, caused him to fall to the ground. And notice the Christological interrogative here when he asked the question. He said, uh, Saul, Saul, this is Jesus talking now, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
That's the question that Jesus asked once that light flashed around Saul and once he fell to the ground. Jesus gave him an experience where he knocked him to the ground and blinded him with the light and asked him why was he persecuting him. And it's amazing if, if, if you look at your life, what if Jesus asked the church the same question? See, we look at this as this is somebody outside of the church. But what are we doing to the church? I wish I had time on this morning. He says, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now come here, church. Be careful who you mess with in the church. I'm just letting you know that Jesus got fed up with Saul trying to bind and persecute Christians. And said he's had enough. And as he was on the road to Damascus, he blinded him, made him fall to the ground. And the voice came out and said, why are you persecuting me? So Jesus looks at you persecuting other Christians as persecuting him. So when you talk about another child of God, you're talking about Jesus. He said, why are you persecuting me? So in other words, what you do to them, you are doing. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Notice the instruction Jesus had. He said, get up. I want you to uh, go into the city. He hadn't even got to Damascus yet. He said, I want you to enter into the city and it shall be told to you what you must do. In other words, Saul didn't get it. Come here. You and I sometimes don't get it. But even though you and I sometimes don't get it, God still has a plan for your life. So when God has a plan for your life and you don't get it, he has to give you an experience to stop you from not doing what it is that he wants you to do. So he gave him an experience where he was blind. And, and, and when God gave him this experience through this vision, he could see more with his eyes closed than he could with them open. Yes, sir. Because his eyes were open. Everybody said open. open. His eyes were open, but Saul could not see what the Lord wanted him to do. And a lot of people are just like that. Their eyes are open, but they can't see how nasty their attitude is. I wish I had two or three people in here that could shout amen. Their eyes are open, but they can't see how unspiritual their behavior is. Their eyes are open, but they can't see how unfaithful they are to living the life that Christ wants them to live. Their eyes are open, but they can't see how bad the relationship with that brother, amen somebody, or that sister would be if you marry him. <laughs> Your eyes are open, but you cannot see. Just like Saul. Because here it is Saul thought uh, that he was on the road to Damascus, but God had him on the road to destiny. Because God is always orchestrating a plan to place you in a position to reach a higher level, watch this, for his purpose. So the experience, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about your 2019. And I want you to think about all of your experiences. All right? Try not to cry. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. All right? And I want you to think about all your experiences. And sometimes we're moving and we're moving and we're wasting time because God is trying to give us experiences to see that he wants to position us for his purpose, but we don't get it. And so God has to allow us to go through an experience, not to break you, but to build you. Amen, somebody. He has to give you of a problem, not to penalize you, not to punish you, but to prepare you. Am I talking to anybody in this place? God gives you an experience. Sometimes it's 
financial woes. Sometimes it's marital problems. Sometimes it's problems with your kids or your grandchildren. Sometimes it's something at work. Sometimes it's something large in your mind that God wants you to do, but he has to give you a problem, an experience. In other words, God wants us to come to church and hear the preacher preach the word of God, and God wants you to sit there, take notes, and obey what you hear, but some of us just don't do that. <laughs> so God says, you know, for, the, for, for those who hear it and don't want to do it, I got to come at them another way to reach them because I still want to use them. So now since they don't see what I'm trying to do, I got to give them an experience. Now, I wish to God that all of us would go to God by hearing the word, hearing how wonderful the members are and receiving all the encouragement. But two or three of you are honest. You had to have your back. <laughs> Myself this morning. You had to have your back against the wall. No money. I ain't talking to nobody here. No money in your in your bank account. You almost had to lose it all for you to finally say, Lord, I need you, Lord, and I need you now. What was God doing? He was giving you. Y'all got the sermon yet? <laughs> he was giving you what? And come on, open up your mouth. He was giving you what? And by show of wave hands and amens, did anybody have to come to God through an experience like me? You knew the word. Amen, somebody. Mom and daddy took you to church. Amen, somebody. You, you knew what the Bible said, but something had to happen in your life for you to finally say, I surrender. I surrender. I give up, Lord. My life is no longer mine. It's yours. I was, me and my wife were traveling uh, back from South Carolina on Friday, and I received a call from a gentleman uh, back home. He, he, he thought I was still the preacher there, and he said that uh, he called me crying. Tough. It's tough for men to be emotional, church. It's tough for men to get into their feelings because we, we want to be men. We want to be people who always have it all figured out. We always want to have a solution to the problem. We want to act like we know it all and we've been through it all and we can fix everything. But two or three brothers in here know you cry sometime too. Because the, the weight of the world and the weight that's on your shoulders sometimes gets so heavy and you have all these expectations on you and you think everybody thinks you know what to do but you really don't. This brother was at that point. He called me and he said, he was crying. I said, man, what, what do you want me to do? for you, to help you. He said, man, I need God. He said, I done lost my daughter. My daughter then went back into the system. Me and my wife are having problems. I don't have no money. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on drugs now. I'm going to this counseling for alcohol and drug abuse. And he just said, man, I, got, I, I never even read the Bible. But he said, man, I got a Bible in my lap right there. Show me something, man. This brother was at the point where he needed God. And let me help you understand. The Lord had tried to reach him through people all these years. Church invitation. Hey, come to church with me. We'd love to have you. We, we want you to be faithful. We want to get you involved into a ministry. So all these years, the Lord has been sending people. Are y'all in here this morning trying to encourage you? But he ignored all of that. And what he does not even understand is God has a plan for his life. And so the only way that God could finally reach him is to allow him to hit rock bottom. Come here. Here's what, here's what I love about God. When you hit rock bottom, there's a rock at the bottom. Y'all ain't even in here this morning. In his name. Oh, Lord. His name. I said his name. It's Jesus. Amen, somebody. And, and, and he can up and turn you around and set your feet on solid ground. Sometimes he has to break you down to build you back up the way he want to build you. Now I'm not no mechanic. I'm a spiritual mechanic, but I'm not no automotive mechanic. But one thing I do know, sometimes when you have engine problems, they have to rebuild it. In order to rebuild anything, you have to take it loose. And sometimes God has to get you there. Yeah. 
through that experience so that he can build you up the way that he wants to build you because he indeed has a calling, a vision, a ministry, a purpose over your life. But we just don't see it. So he has to allow us to sink sometimes down to rock bottom. Wow. So let me give you some observations. I really don't have a long sermon for you today. But I want you to know that on the road to destiny, sometimes God has to give you an experience. And what I don't want is for some of you to enter into 2020 not having realized what God was trying to do through those experiences in 2019. All right? So here's a few observations to consider. Stop wasting your time. Every time you go to a funeral, Every time you hear about the passing of a loved one or passing of somebody you know, it lets you know that time will not last always. Whatever you're going to do, if you're going to write a book, do it right now. If you're going to get right with your children, do it right now. If you're going to be faithful to Jesus Christ, come to church. Watch this. Every time the doors are open, because when you get older, you can get to the point where you want to go and you can't. Look at your name and say, you need to go right now. Go ahead. Every time the doors are open and it does not matter who else goes. You need to go because you understand that God has to give you an experience to help you see that. So stop wasting time. Time keeps going. We stay right here. And we wonder, what would all time go? See, time was moving, you just weren't. Amen. All right. And all of these precious moments that folk who have died would love to have, and we just chill. What you doing? Nothing. Nothing. Y'all ain't even in here this morning. Man, listen, time is precious. One preacher said that the, the clock of life is only wound but once. You may not get another opportunity to do what you can do right now. Start the business. Reconcile with your, with your, with your wife or your husband. Amen, somebody. Get things right with somebody at church. Be faithful right now. Listen, the worst thing in the world is to say, when you're in a nursing home or you're uh, 80 or 90 and you no longer can do what you used to do or even care for yourself, the worst thing in the world is to say, I wish when I was younger and I had a chance to do this, I wish I would have done it. And now you have to live with that until you ride this thing out until the Lord come back or you perish. Stop wasting time, church. With all the love in my heart, and, and I'm going to tell you, I'm systematic, man. I, I got a schedule. Listen, I'm, I'm going somewhere. I got stuff I got to get done. I got projects I'm working on. And listen, listen, I'm going to tell you, the devil is the master at distractions. Because the reason why the devil is the master at distracting you, watch this, you may not like this, but it's going to help you, is because the devil understands time better than we do. If he could plant a demonic thought in your mind, if he can put a doubt in your mind about your ability to be able to rise to the occasion and to perform in this particular area of expertise, to be able to, to rise to higher heights, if he can put a doubt in your mind, the next thing you know, if you entertain a doubt, you can waste time. And am I the only one in here that has allowed doubt to stop me from doing what I know that God has called me to do and if you entertain one doubt it could waste seconds of your life and minutes of your life and hours of your life and days of your life and weeks of your life and months of your life and years of your life on one doubt some of y'all been starting a business for 30 years but somebody told you you won't be able to get the loan from the bank. So every 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 time you get your your your, your mic up to get a loan, you said, "Oh no, I can't." 
that doubt comes back in your mind. Is that right? And, and so you got to make sure you understand he is the mastermind and getting you to be distracted so that you don't accomplish the things that God has purposed and positioned you to accomplish in your life. Because he understands time. Jesus knew that Saul was wasting time. Saul was on the right road, but Saul had the wrong purpose. So what God had to do was give Saul an experience to change his purpose from Judaism to Christianity. And now you need to understand what the Bible says about that because the Bible says in uh, Acts 9 and verse number 15 that Saul was a chosen instrument of Jesus. He was a chosen instrument of Jesus. He had been selected by Jesus to accomplish the particular work in the area of ministry that the Lord wanted him to accomplish. So he said, I can put up with your past. I can put up with your present because I know where you're going to be in your future. Amen, somebody. So stop wasting time. Second observation I want to give you. Evaluate the road that you traveled in 2019. Because let me just tell you something uh, quickly. Everybody in here is on a road. All of us, we're on a road. We're traveling down a road. So you need to evaluate to see whether or not you have been on the right road or the wrong road in 2019. Then, third observation, you need to ponder on your past experiences. If you do not, and this is a thinking sermon, if, if you do not ponder on your past experiences, those areas in which you did not do things right can come back and haunt you in your future. Amen. Amen. You ever you ever sinned against somebody and said something you ought to ought not have said, and then it comes to you like three hours later? I need an honest crowd in here today. Come on and hear somebody. And, and, and by the time that co-worker has closed the door and went back into their office, you say to yourself, Man, I shouldn't have said that. I wasn't even Christian-like right there. I didn't know God didn't appreciate that. What are you doing? You're pondering on your past experiences. Because God is the kind of God, God will allow you to go in circles. Anybody here ever been in circles before? Trying the same thing, want to kill something, wouldn't and die? And you're just going in service and God is looking at you with, with, with his fo hands folded and with his crushed up face like you just won't get it if you don't act right he has to continuously allow the same person to get up under your skin until you act differently that's why he ain't promoted some of y'all you begging to God, God, please get me out of this department. Please promote me. Please get me a better position. Lord, I'm so sick of being around these folk at work. And God is trying to give you an experience and say, look at how you keep acting. Though God is telling you is, some of y'all not liking this. I'm going to say it anyhow in love. Ain't this what God is trying to tell you is, the reason why I put you there is because you are the light of the world. You are the light. You are the salt of the earth. I had to put you there as light to try to put some, take them out of the darkness. But instead of being the light, you be the darkness like them. Ooh, I'm preaching myself happy through here. I know this stuff right, right here. I, I've been through this. Amen, somebody. I know what it's like for God to sit you somewhere to prepare you because you hadn't got the lesson. And you in the corner stoop. Now nah, God won't get me out of here. You, you ready to quit your job knowing that, man, you got bills and car payments and rent notes and all of that kind of, but you just want to get around them people so bad. I ain't got nobody to think it's all they man in there. And you're willing to almost make an irrational decision not based on rationale. And God is saying you're supposed to be in the salt. The light. And I put you around those people because they're in darkness. Fourth observation. I'm almost done. You have to determine 
if you're on the right road or the wrong road. And if you're on the right road, did you have the right purpose? Was it your purpose that you were trying to achieve or God's purpose? Well, you say, preacher, that's a lot of ambiguity. How do I tell whether or not it's my purpose? Because there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. It's nothing wrong with trying to get some stuff. It's nothing wrong with trying to better yourself and your family. You're absolutely correct. But is it for God's glory or yours? Do, do, do you accomplish things, trying to achieve things so God can get the glory? God does not have a problem with you starting a business and making millions of dollars if he knows you're going to give back to the church. God does not have a problem with getting you a car if he knows you'll pick up people for church. God does not have any problem providing gas money for you if you will come to church. But if all you want to do is go around Louisville to smoke weed in the car that you bag God for, God does not get any glory. I'm preaching much better than you responding. God wanted Paul so bad that God gave Saul um, a vision while he was blinded. A lot of preachers preach this sermon and they say, I wonder what Saul saw when he couldn't see. Wonder what Saul saw when Saul couldn't see. You don't even have to wonder. The Bible tells you if you read the whole pericope. The Bible says in verse number 11 and 12 that he was praying. He was praying. He went three days without sight, nor ate or drank, and he was praying. Everybody shout pray. pray. While he was blinded, he was praying. Sometimes God has to get you blind to stop you so that you can pray to him. When is the last time you stopped instead of being so angry and mad and just pray to God? Not one of them fake little prayers. God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and well, you try to sound like you got all these degrees. The real prayers is when you speak from your heart. God, I need you right now, God. God, it hurts so bad to be in this situation. But Lord, I know you got the power. I know you can do it. I know you can bless me because you've done it before. And I won't doubt you right now, Lord, but I need you to come. And I need you to come right now. And I'm going to be faithful until you get here. Those are the kind of prayers that when you pray to your heart to the Lord, when you ain't faking and try to sound good, and I'm not opposed to using your English and your enunciation and using your degree. I'm just saying it needs to be a real prayer, not an orchestrated, sound good kind of prayer. So while he was blinded, the Bible says that the Lord gave him a vision that there was going to be a man by the name of Ananias that was going to come and help him and lay hands on him to receive his sight. That's the vision that God gave uh, Saul while Saul was praying. And what's so interesting is God also gave Ananias a vision. Come here, church. Do you not know that when God has a purpose for your life, he gives a vision to somebody else just to help you? He gave Ananias, God gave Ananias a vision just so that Ananias could help Saul. Uh -huh. So when you have a purpose uh, to do all that God wants you to do, God can place vision in somebody else to help you. Yeah. Can I tell you, when you're faithful to God, that God can send somebody to come help you. Has God ever sent somebody to come and help you? to provide some care and some love and some guidance and some a loving kindness and some nurture in your life. And what we do is we get mad because the people that we've given money to before were not the ones who came. What's wrong with your sister? I'm mad. Why? Such and such should be helping me. Well, I just gave you $100. God just sent me to help you. Name of somebody. But you're mad because you expected somebody else to come and bless you. And when they didn't come and bless you, you couldn't even see that God sent somebody else to come in besides them to bless you. Which is 
a powerful principle that is pregnant with uh, powerful knowledge that God will always provide the nurture and the care that you need. It just may not come from the person to whom you expect. But you always got to give him the glory um, and the praise. So are you on the road to destiny? Are you truly on the road to your destiny? That's what God wants to give you. Have you ignored the experiences that God is trying to give you in your life so that you can turn around and give your life to God? And everything you do is to the glory of God. Everything you do is for the glory of our great Savior. Everything you do is so that God can be looked at in a wonderful, holy way. If you ever tell me good sermon, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm giving it right back to God. I give God the praise. I give God the glory. I'm just happy that he uses a broken vessel like me. Amen, somebody. He can use anybody he wants to. He can use a donkey if he wants to. Amen, somebody. But I'm just happy and thankful that God is a kind God that can use a wretch like me. So I want you to know that recently I was um, driving and um, I was, I was leaving uh, my office here in Newburgh and I was trying, I was trying to get home. And I was driving on Watterson uh, Expressway and I was trying to get onto um, 64, going back home so I can get home to my wife. So my destination was to get home, but however, I had to learn that in Louisville, uh, if you get on the road between 4 to 6 p.m., oh, yeah. Lord, I look like I got some witnesses through here. <laughs> you are going to be in some traffic. Did you know how we do? Uh, I knew that the right lane is the lane that I needed to get on to get to my destination. But sometimes my wife would tell you, she'd get on me about it. I'll wait to try to jump in at the last moment. Oh, I ain't. And because all them cars are in this lane. And I'm like, man, it's bad. About, I'll just sneak in front of somebody when they hesitate. And I'll just jump in front of them uh, right at the end and jump on the interstate to get home to my wife. It's my destination. And, and, and I saw all them cars. And I knew that I should have got in the right lane, but I stayed in this lane. And then at the end, when I got to the place where I needed to get into the right lane, it was so jam-packed. I could not change lanes because by that time there were so many people in that lane that got in that lane and I could not even get over and I thought to myself how many people are traveling the road of life in the wrong lane how many people know they need to make a lane change but they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait and they Traffic is backed up and you can't move because you waited too late. You knew you should have did it a long time ago. Even though that line was backed up, you should have got into the right lane then, but you waited. Everybody shall wait. How many of you know that you have messed up before because you waited too late? I want you to understand that at some point of your Christianity, at some point, you're going to have to understand that God gives you experiences so that you can make a lane change. I think somebody in here today has been traveling the road of life in the wrong lane. You've been going down this lane for decades. Oh, Lord, 60s, 70s, 80s, oh, God, 90s, 2000s. Amen, somebody. And you're going in the same lane when God is giving you experience and say it's time to change lanes. You've been trying to stay in your lane and God says time to change lanes. I don't know about what y'all do here but back where I'm from people used to try to drive cool. You know they didn't want to have seatbelts they just be leaning back. Sometimes you want to just lean back and just, just, hit, just hit a corner and change. Y'all ain't even in here. Change lanes. You don't want to go into 2020 in the same lane with this relationship, in the same lane with your spirituality. You're one and done. You come on Sunday, but no Sunday.
Sunday evening. Amen, somebody. No Wednesday Bible class. No, no Sunday morning Bible study. You've been in the same lake. And if you continue to do it the way you've always done it, you'll always get the same result. How about it, church? Don't wait time. Don't waste time. Don't waste time. The Bible says when Ananias came in verse number 18, the Bible says he laid hands on him and something like scales came off his eyes and he received his sight and, and Ananias commanded Saul, the Bible says, and get up and be baptized. Let's say it together. And get up and be baptized. One more time. And get up and be baptized. One last time. And get up and be baptized. Because before you can change lanes, God has to have a change in your life. So what he commanded him to do once he put hands on him was to get up and be baptized so that he could walk in a different lane that he can travel on a, on the same road. Now he will have the right purpose. Amen, somebody. And some of you in here need to switch lanes even on this morning. Here is your opportunity this morning to switch lanes. And let me just tell you something. Um, what a great day to go into 2020 having been baptized in water for the forgiveness of all of your sins. To go into 2020 with a fresh look, having all your past sins washed away. Amen, somebody. And I'm, I'm done. I'm going to go ahead and give the invitation in just a moment. But I just want somebody here to understand that time is precious. You may not get another chance to do what you can do right now. So I want you to make up your mind. Am I traveling the right road? And if I am, do I have the right purpose. Yeah. Is my purpose all about me? Or is my purpose about sprinkling a little God here and there? Amen. But my purpose really is not about God. When you put God first in your life, in your family, in your finances, and in your faith, God will bless you. I'm a living witness. He will bless you. Anybody here want to go into 2020 with a blessing? You got to put God first. And you got to do it better than you did in 2019. I think we need to have a quick funeral for 2019 right now. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. 2019, don't you come into 2020. I'm sending you back to the pits of hell. Amen, somebody. I'm getting what God has for me. I'm getting my blessings. Amen, somebody. I don't, I don't know who you are. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. This is the way of the churches of Christ. That we give you an opportunity to come to Jesus. If you want to come to Jesus, you got to do the same thing Saul did. Saul was willing to obey the commandment to be baptized for the forgiveness of all of your sins. 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 By believing in the death, burial, resurrection, repenting of sin, confessing Christ, and allowing us to immerse, baptize you today. For the forgiveness of all of your past sins. God will add you to the church of Christ. You have uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do is use your time wisely. Stay on the right road with the right purpose, and you'll be on the road to your destiny. Man, woman, boy, girl, if you're in this place, I want you to come to Jesus right now as we stand together and sing our song of invitation.